You are listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the second of six events in the INCJ 2021 program. I want to welcome you to the seminar, which is called Restorative Justice, the dynamics of knowledge transfer across countries and sectors. It's an online international seminar, and we really hope that the fact that we've got people from four different continents will mean that you will be fascinated by this topic. Uh, I'm John Scott, and my job today is to chair the event, which is going out live to over 25 countries. Uh, we've got about 120 people signed into the Eventbrite. Now, not everybody can make it on the day, but we do hope that people will be able to pick it up either on a podcast or on a YouTube later. And we're particularly keen that people feel they can participate. So use the chat line to send in questions or comments, but also feel free to tweet and retweet anything that you want to add. If you want to follow this up in any way, you can find us on www.criminaljusticenetwork.net or if you want to join us on Twitter, it's at INTCJ Network and we'll be really pleased if you want to uh, create a theme, use the hashtag, hashtag restorative justice or uh, hashtag INCJ today. So how's it going to work? Well, first of all, we're going to have over the program four short presentations, and we've got a round table, as you can see in front of you, and we've got four distinguished guests. First of all, uh, I'd like to introduce Edith Turge. Uh, she is the executive director of the European Forum for Restorative Justice, and she's based in Leuven in Belgium. Welcome, Edith. Uh, next, uh, Vivian Guerin. He's an adjunct professor from Trinity College, Dublin, but he's widely known across Europe for his many contributions to the Council of Europe and has contributed over many years on justice, probation and restorative justice issues. Uh, then, having got up really early, Gail, I'm well impressed that you're functioning at this time of the morning from the United States. Uh, Gail uh, Burford is Emeritus Professor at the University of Vermont and a visiting scholar on restorative justice at the Vermont Law School. And it's great that you've been able to join us, Gail. Uh, and finally, uh, Kelvin uh, Abuki, uh, who is uh, coming live uh, from a correctional maximum security institution uh, in Nigeria. Uh, Kelvin, could you turn off your microphone? Because I think we've got a bit of background noise. So if you could uh, mute yourself, that, that would be great. Uh, and, and Kelvin uh, works on restorative justice issues with uh, offenders and has a psychology background. Now, just, just our experts are leaving me drooling with what contribution they can make, and it's fantastic, uh, colleagues, that you can join us. Uh, I'm going to just name check now our, our presenters, but we'll introduce them uh, more precisely when we go through the programme. We've got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, Anna Oprea, Mary Ivek, uh, Fiona Tito, Wheatland, Janet Hope, uh, Luke Roberts and, and Branka Perukac uh, from Croatia will be presenting briefly to us, but the idea is that they will spark conversations around the table. And we do want people from our YouTube audience to send in questions and comments too. We've got quite a lot of time. So do make this live by adding uh, to the conversation. And I was, I was saying uh, to colleagues in the round table before, we'll only prove this is live if things go wrong. <laughs> so maybe some of the uh, presentations uh, will be a bit sticky as we switch from uh, material to material, but please bear with us. It's the interest and the topic which will grab attention and it's just great to be here and have such a rich program to consider today. 
Okay, so I think that's the introductions done. And let's get down to it by asking Anna Oprea to kick the event off. Now, uh, Dr. Oprea teaches in the social work team at De Montfort University in Leicester in the United Kingdom. Uh, she's currently working on a Romanian translation of the United Nations second edition of the Handbook on Restorative Justice. And she's a founding member of the East Midlands Restorative Justice Forum, which is a network of mixed local professionals interested in the development of restorative justice practice. And I'd like to give the floor to Anna, over to you. Thank you, um, John. And as you were saying, I think uh, a round of thanks you, thank you are in order to you and everyone at ANCJ for giving us the opportunity to meet today. Um, to all of our presenters and guests for accepting our invitation and to everyone in the audience for taking the time to watch and join the conversation. And really the purpose of today is just to open up a conversation about the use of knowledge transfer language in the context of restorative thinking. And we actually do not have all the answers. <laughs> Uh, we will try to find some together today, or at least give um, the start to um, a discussion on the topic and to keep the spirit of restorative justice um, real today. We're going to try to create a dialogue, um, you know, a dialogue like Tim Chadman likes to say in, in that in that sense. So um, very quickly, a short introduction about, you know, the topic and um also to acknowledge that much of the work that many of us have been doing in the past, maybe 50 years, I, I'm not 50, but I know uh, before I was born, uh, <laughs> um, there's been a lot of uh, work around the world and in different institutions and organizations to, to try to increase the use of restorative approaches and practices and the various steps of the criminal justice process and across different countries and as um, John has acknowledged just now, you know, United Nations is working on that and the European Commission and the European Forum for Restorative Justice and many other local um, initiatives in different countries are trying to increase the use of restorative justice in different parts of the criminal justice system. But there's also an increasing interest and enthusiasm in um, implementing restorative justice um, or restorative thinking and approaches in, in domains outside of the criminal justice system like in education and in social care, different workplaces in, in our communities and neighborhoods. So, however, um, I, I have struggled to find a common language when discussing about this topic. And I've purposely before, I mean, last year when, when John and I were discussing about uh, this potential webinar, I've tried to do uh, a literature search around um, knowledge transfer and um, around restorative justice. And um, in my university database, I could only find about 12 articles from which I kept only three that I thought were relevant. Um, I can acknowledge the fact that there will be literature out there that talks about knowledge transfer. It's just maybe I haven't used the right key terms to find them. I did manage to find one great article, so I encourage you to go and read it if you find it, by Green, Johnston and Lambert from 2013 about uh, restorative justice movement and uh, how it's developed in whole under uh, a knowledge transfer project funded by the National Lottery. And uh, Green, Johnston and Lambert, they, they coined the term restorative expansion. So <laughs> it is a different way of talking about knowledge transfer, I think. And there are many ways in which I also identified discussions about knowledge transfer across the literature, aside from the colloquial increasing the use of restorative justice, things like project implementation or learning in organizations, or like Ivo Edson has um, told me, look into policy transfer. Edith uh, said, look into social impact. So um, there is a variety of ways in which we discuss knowledge transfer in our community, restorative community. Um, and I only have to ask myself, I did ask myself, um, and it's an invitation for you to think as well, uh, what are the ways in which you are discussing about knowledge transfer? What's the language you're using when you think about transferring knowledge about restorative justice in different settings um, across your work, the work that you're doing? 
I also have to acknowledge, and I, Janet has encouraged me to talk about this in a personal way because storytelling and personal relationships are part of our restorative ways of thinking. I do think that I have a personal connection with the topic being the fact that I was born and raised in Romania, which is a country that's been always a crossroad of influences between East and the West. I've witnessed throughout my life different transitions from communism to democracy, prison reforms, uh, even the establishment of a new probation system that John Scott knows about. And uh, I've always witnessed some pressures from the West to always modernize and update uh, our ways of doing things. And um, in a nutshell, that's been, you know, knowledge transfer, transferring new knowledge from the West to the East. I also trained as a social worker that was supposed to work as a probation officer. And that I think gave me a sort of a capacity to apply knowledge from different domains um, interchangeably. So I got used to, um, you know, working with different concepts in different settings and transferring those concepts to make them work for the purposes of my, um, my practice. Um, there's also a bit of, but I'm not going to expand on it. Those who know me, I've traveled around. I <laughs> went to visit Gail and Mary across the world. And I, ex I purposely exposed myself to learning through international experiences. And I did notice the various ways in which we talk about restorative justice implementation and also some of the challenges that um, different parts of the world have faced. And sometimes we can even call them frustrations of failures to implement restorative justice in a, in a sustainable way. So that gives takes me to another reflective question that maybe we could try to 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 I don't know, find some answers today is how can we transfer knowledge about restorative thinking, restorative justice in a sustainable way that lasts and that sticks. And I'm <laughs> using the term stickability, which if Belinda Hopkins is watching, we've discussed this uh, last summer. And I know it's a funny way of terming it, but it actually says what it's supposed to be saying. How do we make restorative justice stick um, in different contexts and settings? But coming um, very briefly, uh, discussing about this knowledge transfer, we need to understand what knowledge transfer is. So um, I think when we talk about restorative knowledge, we have to think of knowledge as a social construct, a construct that's developed and uh, maintained through social situation, and it evolves and it gets interpreted and used and reused. And remember that if, we, you, if you think about restorative justice using this term, of knowledge and knowledge transfer. Remember that knowledge only grows when it's used and it's depreciating when it's not used. So if we don't use it, it just loses its, um, its, its, um, its nature and its strength. So we also have to think maybe today uh, we can discuss more explicitly about different types of knowledge when it comes to restorative justice. What, what do we know about restorative justice and in what context are we using the term restorative justice? Is it theoretical thinking? Is it evidence-based? Is it our experiential way of knowing and learning about restorative justice? Is it about a global concept, a local concept, or the more, um, you know, nowadays we use the local concept as well, like in international um, ideas implemented at local level. And we also have to think about how we transfer knowledge. And there are, there's a various range of literature out there that I do encourage you to go and read about knowledge transfer theory and models of knowledge transfer. And that all acknowledge, and I think we also have to acknowledge today, that knowledge is actually very difficult to transfer generally. It doesn't matter if it's restorative justice or something else. It requires a willingness for us to share, an openness for us to learn, and a readiness for us to change the way we do things. Um, and also to acknowledge that, you know, any kind of knowledge transfer initiatives that we implement in different organizations are gonna have an uneven impact on the members, if it's in the school, on their staff. So, you know, knowledge is, um, is transmitted and learned at various levels and used at various levels by different people in our organization. So, um, and also, sometimes in, in some places, as you will 
I'm sure very well witnessed, and maybe Kelvin um, um, guests talk about this as well, is that in some, in some places you will notice that idea of knowledge is power paradigm and mindset. And in some organizations that are very bureaucratic and hierarchical, there is, you know, sharing the knowledge becomes very difficult because it's always kept at top levels. So hence a, a, a question for everyone today um, and um, just an open invitation is, what would be so specific about knowledge transfer in a restorative context? And reflecting on that question myself for today, well, there are many, many, a couple of topics that we could approach and some of our next presenters are gonna touch on is um, very specific to restorative knowledge transfer is the, the language that we use, the labels that we um, apply to things. Do we talk about restorative in a justice setting, a practice or approach? Is the movement, is this thinking like I use it? Is it discourse? And, um, just also to think that I am Romanian and there is no direct translation of restorative in Romanian language. It, it's, it's, it, it, is, it seems and sounds very foreign uh, to our native Romanians and it, and it requires an explanation, an additional exp explanation to it. So um, a possible reflective question for this, uh, what would be the best ways to transfer restorative knowledge while maintaining the core nature and values? Um, and is there a way for us to prevent a tokenistic implementation of restorative knowledge across different uh, settings and different countries? And last but not least, because I do want us to have a conversation, we have to reflect when it comes to transferring knowledge about restorative justice, about learning mechanisms, how people learn, and whether the learning produces actually changes in behavior and how sustainable um, those changes are. What does it take uh, for that change in behavior to remain there and be perpetuated from, uh, from one person to another? As we know, many people that learn about restorative justice in an organization, they will leave. So you, you, there is the need for constant, constant knowledge transfer through training or other things. So I know I've exceeded my time with one minute. So just one, one last um, reflective questions that I, I, I have for everyone. So when we think of you know, successful restorative justice implementation projects, what were the factors that actually fostered sustainability in that place? Because if we are able to identify those things, we could potentially try and see if we can replicate them. So um, there are other things that I could talk about, but um, I do want us to have a conversation. So thank you. Okay, well, some challenges and uh, some questions there. So let's th throw it open uh, to the round table. And if out on YouTube, you've got uh, comments or questions you'd like to add, perhaps use the chat, chat box now uh, to uh, throw those into the debate too. We've got loads of time for other qu questions to come in later, but let's see. Um, I think Gail had his hand up first. So unmute yourself, Gail, if you'd like to make a comment or a question. No, no, that was a bit of applause for Anna Maria's presentation. Oh, that was applause. Okay, so uh, it isn't putting his hand up to to to, to make a, a point. It's applause, uh, right? So, does anybody like to make a, a first comment? Then pick up uh, from uh, Anna's comments. Come on, round table. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna throw the, the throw the. I think Janet has her hand up. Has she? Okay. Uh, Janet, no. Janet, go with Janet. Anna Maria, thank you so much for that great introduction. And um, it was lovely to hear both the theoretical and the personal aspects. Um, you gave us a lot to think about and to reflect on. I wonder if you could choose just one question that you'd really like to hear everybody reflect on in their presentations this evening or in the questions answers. Is there one that's really high priority for you of the ones that you articulated there? Thank you, Janet. Um, well, reflecting is, is um, I'm not sure if, if it matters what's dear to me. I think it's ma it matters what's dear to everyone and each of us within our different organizations. I do have my own, um, let's say, frustrations and challenges to face working in a university, which is a highly hierarchical organization and um, um, 
I do have my own struggles trying to, you know, make people around me or becoming contagious <laughs> um, to use a pandemic. I'm not sure if it's the best way to, uh, but, you know, to, to make people understand and become enthusiastic with, with the whole concept. But I think this is just the initial part. What I actually want us to, ref what, what I would like us to reflect on today is how do we actually make that next step Enthusiasm is just one first line. That 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 step between understanding and putting it in practice and making it last. That I think is what's important at this point in time. And I've I do follow social media, and there are a lot of discussion. And um, for example, Peter Wolf tweeted yesterday a very interesting um, question. He was asking, "Do we actually make a difference?" Is there something that changed in our system because of restorative justice? So to, to make it short, Janet, I think for today, that whole idea about sustainability, so how do we make the next step of make being restorative being something that's used widely and in the long term and staying in that organization no matter who comes and who leaves, if you make sense. Okay, so it seems sustainability is a, a one-word answer. Um, who'd like to pick that up and run with that? Thank you, Vivian. Yeah, I was, going, I was keen to come in on this anyway in the, in the context of the organisational issues and the related points that Anna made, which I think are really important for sustainability as, as much as anything else. And John will be aware that in my time with the Irish Probation Service, uh, that would have been something uh, not just in relation to restorative justice, but other areas that I that I struggle with, because we often know as practitioners what what practice is good or effective or whatever. But I don't think, as Anna has alluded to, that those practices will become embedded within a group of professionals unless there is an organizational commitment to do that. And at some level, in my experience, you need somebody at a at an appropriately senior level who lives sleeps and breathes restorative justice or whatever within an organization and who champions it because otherwise as anna has said people come people go um you know some individuals in the organization may wish to adopt a particular practice like restorative justice or restorative practice others may not um and the level of uptake can vary considerably within groups of individuals or, or individuals. Um, and for, for me, as I say, I, I don't claim to have all the answers, but I do think that there is uh, a definite need to have an organizational commitment to whatever type of practice we're talking about, in this case, restorative, in order for for. A, for the practice to be implemented, B, for it to be implemented consistently and appropriately, and C, for it to be sustainable. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, another comment? Okay, Fiona, thank you. Um, I think one of the things that we've noticed in Australia while we've been doing work in this area is that you really have to learn how to do it yourself um, in terms of not just restorative justice, justice, but working out what being in relationship to people means organisationally, at a personal level, within your family, all of those sorts of things. And I find quite powerful lessons almost every day um, in looking at how easy it is to fall out of being restorative and thinking about, okay, so how would I be better to respond to this particular thing um, if I am actually committed to restorative practices in our society, which is the sort of scope that we're looking at um, in Canberra. Um, so I, I, I think you have to walk your talk with this in a, in a really very fundamental sort of way and um, learn. And because so much of our culture is adversarial, um, not just the justice system, but a whole lot of other places. So, and, and sort of looking at power over, whereas what we're focusing a lot of the time is um, exercising power with someone and also doing that. And 
trying to do that in your own family, trying to do that in your own community and trying to do that in your work organisations is itself setting an example of a different way of doing things. And you learn as well and you understand the difficulties, I think, better that some people face. Thanks very much. Anybody else want to pick up sustainability? Thanks, Edith. I don't know how much my answer or, or comment would focus on sustainability, but I think what makes restorative justice uh, very specific in terms of knowledge transfer is I think that this is uh, an approach or movement, I don't want to define it, which is quite much value-based and principle-based. Um, so I think any kind of sustainability needs that these kind of values are also acknowledged uh, and supported in an individual level, organizational level, uh, and even societal level. So I think this is quite specific uh, in restorative justice. I hope you agree with that. Yeah, uh, uh, lots of nods around the table. Um, can I just remind everybody out on YouTube that we want your comments as well, so I can put them to, to the speakers, if that's okay. Um, apparently, there are over 50 viewers out there on YouTube, and I can't believe you don't have opinions, so please use the chat line. Okay, anybody else want to um, comment? Because we're going to move on in a moment. So uh, it seems that people uh, are focusing in on the values that they have to be embedded and there needs to be ownership in the organization, but maybe you have to live them out in your own life too. Um, Anna, let's go back to you for a last comment before we move on. Do you want to uh, say anything? Very, very short comments. Um, that I've actually spoken before the webinar and shared with everyone here, except, except probably Kelvin. Um, is that whole uh, fence painting that Vivian, if you remember, we had that conversation. Um, and it ba it's based on a, a very Romanian and a local um, theory of um, shapes without substance, meaning that sometimes we, we, when we do make a change within an orga organization, it's, it's done very much like using labels, using terms, but actually at the core, uh, at the core, it's not very much changed, exactly what it is, is talking. So we, when we do start, I think my reflection is when we start projects that refer to transferring knowledge of restorative justice in a new setting is to have a think of how do we actually make changes that matter? Um, um, like Fiona was saying, how do we make changes that are going to change those mindset so people do not revert back to default, default ways of thinking because when we go into a crisis like you're a teacher and Luke is going to talk about that you're a teacher in, a, in your classroom and something goes wrong what's what's going to be, be your first approach is it the restorative approach or is going to be your default approach of I don't know maybe sometimes punitive approach or whatever that default setting is for each person thank you and making a difference is making a difference in the way you do the job, not just handle a, a difficulty or a problem. So th this is this is profound material. Okay, uh, Anna, thank you for starting us off in such a stimulating way. We're now going to move on uh, and we're going to look at a, a whole city's journey. So this is big stuff again. Um, so we're moving on to a topic which is Canberra's journey of becoming a restorative city. So this is a, a real challenge uh, to cover uh, in a 20 minute slot. So we're going to ask Mary, Fiona and Janet to undertake this particular challenge for us. Uh, Mary uh, Ivec, uh, or Ivec is at the Australian National University at, uh, at the Centre for Restorative Justice, where she's been uh, since 2007. Uh, she convenes the Canberra Restorative Community Network, which has over 600 members, uh, and she's been interested in sharing and learning about the applications of restorative justice practices across many uh, social issues. Um, her colleague, uh, Dr. Fiona Tito uh, Wheatland, uh, was the executive officer of the Re Law Reform Advisory Council during its reference on Canberra as a restorative city 
during the period 2016 to 2018 and wrote the Bright Ideas Evidence Paper, bringing all the research and public consultations for that reference together, right at the heart of this. Um, and Dr. Janet Hope uh, has a background, this is interesting, uh, as both a biochemist and a lawyer, and has over two decades of experience in disability and mental health advocacy and victim support. And she joined the Canberra Restorative uh, Community Network in 2016. Now, these three between them, have a fabulous wealth of experience and I won't get in the way any longer. Just hand the floor of the round table over to the three of you. Thank you very much. I think Mary's going to kick off. Hi, thank you, John. Thanks again, Anna Maria, for the, for the invitation. And um, I'd really like to um, begin by acknowledging that Fiona, Janet and I are on the very beautiful lands of the Ngunnawal people and we acknowledge their continuing culture of 60,000 years and their living connection with this land, which was never ceded, and their love for their children. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and emerging. Now, I'm not sure whether, um, Rob, whether you're able to share the um, some of the photos. We weren't going to put together too many um, facts and figures in terms of presentations, but we had some photos that may or may not be able to come up of some um, of, of some of our surroundings um, here in Canberra. And one of the photos is of our most senior Ngunnawal elder, Auntie Agnes Shea. And um, we, um, if we can go to the photo of, of Auntie Agnes Shay, she's our most senior Ngunnawal elder, and she says that her Ngunnawal ancestors believed in the importance of gathering together for the purpose of building relationships, sharing knowledge, and traditionally Aboriginal tribes came together in Canberra to deal with important business and for ceremonial occasions. So in the Ngunnawal language, Canberra actually means meeting place. So the next slide is um, just basically any one of our backyards looks like this. It's really um, fondly referred to as the bush capital of, um, of Australia. So we're about two hours um, away from the ocean um, and... Uh, we are the next, yeah, we can sort of see where is Canberra. You can see the arrow. We're sort of in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, so we're just heading into winter here. And um, although last night when I was speaking to Anna, she was telling me that it was snowing. So that was really very peculiar. The next photo shows the fires that we had, the terrible fires, which are very close by here Um just over 12 months ago. Um, so in terms of our Canberra as a restorative city journey, um, Rob, if you can take us to the next slide. Um, as I've got there, 60,000 years ago, um, the pioneers of restorative justice, really, our First Nations peoples. And so we actually work really closely with um, Auntie Agnes and the elders, because we actually feel we have much to learn from them um, in this journey. Um, in being in Canberra, we are incredibly fortunate to um, have uh, Professor John Braithwaite here at the ANU and at the um, uh, Regulatory Institutions Network now, RegNet is referred to as the School of um, Regulation and Global Governance. So I've been really very fortunate to be um, working with John and Val Braithwaite um, and to have really been introduced to these ideas. Um, John was tells us a story about his involvement with the ACT Restorative Justice Act in 2004 and how he actually envisaged not just restorative justice, but restorative education and restorative health and restorative sports and everything restorative. And so 
this sort of story was always sort of in the back of my mind, but I really had no idea about this sort of thinking through how I, I didn't really sort of see the relevance in terms of um, how it might apply. I mean, this this has sort of been an emerging journey for me over many decades. My background's in social work, um, working mainly in refugee re um, refugee trauma and torture rehabilitation and cross-cultural mental health. Um, for many years, working with our refugee populations and seeing the impact, not just of the trauma from where they came, but also the ongoing trauma that is created by our systems, um, the one that particularly was devastating not just to our Indigenous um, brothers and sisters but also to our um, refugees was the child protection system um, where children um, are, seen, are seen to be in danger or, or unsafe and so our statutory child protection systems have for over 200 years been incredibly punitive and the legacy of that intergenerational trauma for our Indigenous population is still um, very much alive today. And so it was really in 2008 when I started working with Valerie Braithwaite around some child protection research and I met Fiona um, at, um, we used to meet at the, at the, at the local um, farmers' markets and we got to know each other. And Fiona was a foster carer. I was doing a lot of work with um, families that were involved with the child protection system. And we were very um, extremely distressed about how uh, the system was impacting um, on families, on children, on workers, and it was really sort of through um, feeling quite powerless and helpless and nothing works that we, um, um, I, I guess, were sort of walking this journey about um, that there has to be another way. And um, back in 2000, um, as I said, in 2008, Valerie started working on some research she very kindly took me across to Nova Scotia where I'd met uh, Jennifer Llewellyn and, and Gail Burford and gradually sort of starting to sort of hear that in the child protection space at least, we could actually be thinking about how we intervene with families very differently. So the focus for, um, for us in Canberra um, for the work um, that Fiona and I first sort of, um, I guess, came together around sort of wasn't really around restorative cities. It was really around how do we affect some change in, in the child protection system. Um, so it's really, again, thanks to, to John Braithwaite and Val to introduce us to, to people like Gail um, and then to people like Paul Nixon, who's the former chief social worker in New Zealand, um, who invited us to Wanganui in 2014 to say, well, you know, they're doing this, Wanganui is a restorative city and you should come. And I said to Fiona, you've got to come. I can't go on my own. I can't see where this is going to lead. Um, and then as Gail Burford said, well, Canberra seems to be the very logical place um, given the fact that you have John Braithwaite there. And I was thinking, um, Anna, before when you were talking about universities, um, we have uh, John Braithwaite, even with John being here at the ANU, it has still does not mean that uh, ANU has become a restorative university. Um, I think we need a critical mass. And so it was really in sort of, the international sort of connections and then sort of using um, our local sort of community and, and, and John would regularly walk the uh, corridors of, um, of the politicians with us to try and um, see if anyone in the political area was interested in, in sort of restorative approaches. And, and we did actually have a, a very committed um, a uh, group of uh, successive um, attorneys general who were very keen to explore this idea. So it was really trying to sort of bring together 
you know, collectively the people who we um, had worked with over the decades, who we knew had some interest, uh, John's work on the RISE experiments in the 1990s, it was really bringing all these uh, relationships together to start a conversation which was to apply, to think about Canberra more broadly as a restorative city because we realised we can't just look at child protection as in and of themselves. Um, we have to really look at it across the board. Fiona, can I pass on to you at this point? Yes, that's fine, Mary. Um, okay, the what happened after the... 2016 is where Mary's story finishes up, is that we, um, the Law Reform Advisory Council, which I was the executive officer of at that stage, was asked to do a reference on um, Canberra as a restorative city. And we chose, we had to, to choose some focus areas to do the, the interviews with people. So we chose child protection and public housing disputes as two areas because our attorney wanted areas where current practice most dis most affected the disadvan most disadvantaged people in our community. Um, we did that. Um, we interviewed people. I wrote all that up in the evidence paper and we released the final report of the Law Reform Advisory Council at the end of 2018. And then the government um, was finally released it and put forward its vision paper at the end of um, November, like 12 months later. Um, and um, so if the next slide just shows you the cover of it, it doesn't um, actually um, ha have the content. Um, it was very interesting, actually. The um, government um, wrote quite a lot of stuff about what they saw as their vision, but most of it involved them not doing anything much, but the community doing a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, so um, we were already doing some of that anyway. So we moved on. Um, do you want to talk about the community-led initiatives that we've done as part of the network, Mary? You need to get off your muting. Thanks. So, I mean, one of the main things really that has been consistent since 2016 um, are monthly meetings where um, during COVID we've actually gone to online, but um, we, started, uh, we started sort of regular monthly meetings where um, we would um, basically, whoever turned up, turned up, and it was to really discuss sort of... Um, restorative approaches where the we have some key organisations that were very interested um, in restorative justice. So it was really to try and raise awareness to, in to sort of look at what works in different programs. I mean, even though um, we are the national capital, we have the highest level of income in the country and supposedly the highest level of education, we have some pretty appalling figures in terms of removal of children, in terms of incarceration, um, and basically presenting um, restorative approaches and examples from overseas um, really sort of, um, and I guess, wet people's appetite for looking at how to do things differently. And, again, we drew so much on our international colleagues, um, Canberra sort of, because we're sort of the centre for government, they really like being able to have international people because even though, again, we have John Braithwaite, it's like, ah, it's much better when you've got people from Hull and Leeds and uh, New Zealand and Vermont. So we, again, have a huge amount of gratitude um, for, for our international colleagues um, we then sort of um, went to twice a month. So they're short, they're meetings of about one hour. But over these past five years, the relationships between organisations, between people, whether you're retired, whether you're, um, it's basically, you know, you leave your title at the door and, and we come as, um, as citizens who are interested in restorative approaches, in sharing um, you know, our various experiences, our challenges, 
Um, so really that has been sort of the main, I guess, um, uh, mechanism by which we um, uh, try to um, keep growing this critical mass. Um, and, you know, it, it really sort of seemed to, um, it, it was nice when you then started having the government advisors coming to your meetings and really listening. So we sort of didn't feel like we needed to keep knocking on their door. They actually were coming to us. Um, so that that's really all I want to say on that, Fiona. Janet, would you like to talk about what's happened with um, the University of Canberra? Yeah, sure, but perhaps before I begin, I might check in about our time. I don't want to take up more time overall than... John, I think you're on mute. Yeah, go for it. You're doing fine. We, okay. By the way, we've had five comments come from outside, which I'll squeeze in as soon as you finish. <laughs> Keep going. Okay. Well, um, I haven't prepared, um, you know, orderly thoughts, but I'm going to try and pick up on some of what's been said. So, um, Fiona, I think in our introductory sort of conversation, talked about living restorative, re living restoratively. Um, uh, and one of the other, I think it might have been Vivian, commented about the need for someone at the top or someone in a leadership role who is able to do that. And I think um, one point I'd make is that this um, series of meetings, the network that uh, Mary's been describing, is one way in which we can support each other to do that and just seek personal support to maintain those values and that, that way of being. Um, and also that it doesn't necessarily need to be someone at the top of a hierarchy who plays that role because I think you'll hear from the way that Mary described uh, at the beginning the process in Canberra. Um, her story was a very relational one. It's about people meeting. It's about people getting to know each other and talking. And she herself, I think, is, is a real embodiment of those values. And she's not at the top of a hierarchy, but this network model seems to work really well. So I think from my point of view, um, I joined that network in 2016. Um, and I guess I could speak a little bit to what it can enable um, when there is a network that brings people together around the city and Canberra is a city that has some special characteristics that make this even more possible. Um, for someone like me to be a part of the, the network for a few years and then to step into um, a university job only about a year ago, I think I've been there exactly a year. And in the time that I've been there, I've been able to achieve a lot um, because I've been able to draw on that network. So I've been able to draw on it for personal support in a, uh, an in institutional environment that is, as, as we've commented, not always restorative in itself. But I've been able to um, create an experience for students um, of the Restorative Justice Unit, which is a really special part of what we have here in Canberra, sort of world-leading criminal justice, restorative justice unit, um, and so I've been able to adopt a model of knowledge transfer that is very much not the I've read a chapter in a book, um, I've been given a lecture, it's been a one-way transmission and students have sort of said, oh, okay, that's restorative justice. So um, instead I've been able to run a, um, uh, a class where students are interacting with leaders uh, within the criminal justice system around the city, um, not just from the restorative justice unit, but from other parts of the criminal justice system that I've been able to gain access for them through that network. Um, the students, I've then been able to run um, an iterative process with students where they're exposed to things experientially and then they reflect on it. I can read their reflections, so it makes it a two-way learning process, not me to them only, but them to me. Um, and then by the time they come to the part of the unit where we look at restorative justice in the criminal justice setting, um, I know them quite well. I can tell what their, what their preconceptions and misconceptions and attitudes and orientations might be. Um, and then I'm able to give them a, a really strong experiential experience with the restorative justice unit where uh, they then write a, a reflective essay. And once again, I have 2,000 words of reflection from these students who've been very well prepared to give us information about how the public in general or um, emerging professionals in this area might perceive restorative justice. So it's a very networked, iterative, reflective 
relationally oriented um, way of teaching um, within the university environment. And just um, I'd like to sort of put in a plug for universities. So we're talking about knowledge transfer. Um, yes, universities are competitive, evaluative uh, places, but they're also a place where we have access to emerging professionals in all kinds of, of relevant um, professional areas who are at the cusp of, of entering the profession or who are making a career change. So many of the conditions for learning that Anna spoke to at the beginning, it's been very difficult to set up a um, knowledge transfer because people have to be ready and receptive um, and listening and all that sort of stuff. We have access to people at, that, at a phase of their lives where they're in that mode. And in terms of stickability, uh, we're able to create the conditions in a university environment that allow people to take it on as, as part of their identity as a, as a professional as they then go out into policing, corrections, social work, um, healthcare. So the work that we're doing in the university, I think, um, does fit with that classic kind of knowledge economy. It feels a bit early 2000s now, kind of idea of the university at the hub of a knowledge ecology. Um, but if we import our restorative value set into it, we can really do a lot with it. So I might leave it there um, and hand back over to Fiona. Okay. Well, can you hand back to me? Because I think we probably do need to... Uh, move into more open uh, question times, if that's all right. Now, I've got about five uh, comments that I'd like to bring from the YouTube audience. So out there, thanks very much. Um, first one, quickly, the word sustainable maybe has lost some of its uh, power because it's been uh, overused. So let's try to get back to the original meaning of sustainable. Good point there from someone called Stephen Allende. Um, somebody else saying they prefer the idea of knowledge exchange. Uh, knowledge transfer means more of a, I'm giving you knowledge. Exchange is uh, softer, sometimes better, uh, implies more mutual learning, much better for the spirit of uh, restorative justice. Um, uh, I think that's a, a subtle, a subtle point. Um, uh, I hope I've captured this right. Restorative justice key to ensure sustainability uh, is to work smarter with internal partners. This, I think, echoes some of the Canberra points. Uh, the danger is sitting back and waiting for referrals. Go out there and get them. That was somebody who feels rather strongly about making partnerships work. Um, and uh, I think this idea of uh, knowledge not being about transfer, but about interacting and listening has come through from an, an, a, another point. Uh, a final one, uh, uh, someone, uh, Steve Pitts, saying, really good to raise values and principles which have got to be explored and keep on exploring them. Now, thanks very much for those comments out there. Please keep them coming in as we go through uh, the rest of this session. Now, back to the panel. Gail, really good to have an American perspective on what we've heard so far. Let's have a comment from you. Well, thank you. I, um, I'm fascinated by... Um, uh, hearing Canberra's story each time I hear it, and it's growing and it's it's building. Um, some of the comments that just came in were ones that were resonating with me about what what's happening to the word sustainable. And in some ways, I think it's been hijacked a little bit by neoliberal thinking in terms of something that we're trying to create that then stays there forever, which digs in underneath the restorative values and I think erodes them over time. Um, I'm thinking particularly right now of Valerie Braithwaite's chapter. Um, uh, she recently wrote about the families as the, <clears throat> the source of the sustainability of uh, restorative values that bubble up from families, from cultures and communities into these institutions where we want to see the, those practices within those institutions be responsive and regulated over time so that they actually reflect the, the deeper uh, enduring meanings, those rich uh, values that keep getting recreated over time 
amongst families and and uh, relationships where people have lifetime investments with one another and takes away some of our expectations that we're going to create governmental organizations and systems that are going to stay there and be there for us forever. I think in some ways this thinking challenges that notion of a static form of governance that uh, we oughtn't um, uh, we ought to just get it to where we want, and then it'll it'll reward us in some ways. And I think there's an underlying um, um, obligation on our parts to keep challenging that over time. Thank restorative, restorative justice doesn't freeze anything, does it? No, that's exactly right. <laughs> okay, um, uh, Kelvin, it would be very good to have your perspective on what we're hearing as well, if you'd like to uh, contribute at, uh, in this discussion. So if you'd like to unmute and, uh, and share a point, that would be yeah, no just great. Kelvin, okay, what, would you, uh, what would you like to say? Can you hear a, me? Yes, we can hear you beautifully. Really good. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, here in Nigeria, we, we the uh, practice of restorative justice is... Uh, somehow new this system uh most especially the criminal justice system and um we are battling with uh, trying to orientate people about restorative justice uh the functions and um the benefits that can be derived from uh, restorative justice especially the criminal justice system so um Actually, uh, we've had a lot of challenges uh, in uh, trying to implement uh, uh, restorative justice here in Nigeria. Uh, when it comes to knowledge transfer, uh, we try as much as possible to uh, bring down our practices to the rural communities, especially uh, uh, taking into cognizance that um, most of the offenders we keep here in the maximum security prison of correctional facility from the rural areas. Uh, another challenge we have is uh, the issue of uh, uh, availability of uh, uh, restorative justice experts. Uh, as it stands now, uh, I am the only person who has been trained in restorative justice in uh, this uh, correctional facility that uh, is as big as um, uh, 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 having, uh, we are having about uh, more than a thousand uh, inmates offenders here. So the job on me is uh, very, very, very enormous. So uh, these are some of the challenges we have, uh, especially here in Nigeria. Uh, we are counting on the support of the government the federal government, and the other government from the states and the local government to help us uh, in these uh, challenges to surround them and, uh, and uh, practice uh, our profession, especially the uh, restorative justice properly. So these are some of the issues we have. And that's the comment I have to make for now. That's Thank you very much. Absolutely pioneering work. And you're speaking to us today from a secure correctional establishment. So thank you very much for arranging that. And it's humbling to hear that these principles are being brought alive in such a tough environment. Thank you very much. Uh, Edit, I wonder if you could also comment about this whole uh, city approach and how what's is there a european uh, perspective on uh, maybe a whole system approach which you've heard we've heard about this morning well that's a difficult question john um as the european forum uh, for restorative justice we bring together different cities in a working group um, which are all interested to become a restorative city but what we see is that each story is different and uh, each, um, each city has their own um, resources. Um, and I think what you mentioned from Canberra are really 
important resources and also shows that that in many cases it's a variety of, of resources or or supporting factors but also the way um, people can move forward with the idea is um, is very unique and very much depends on the local circumstances I think what common is that 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 you need um, this kind of relational approach that that was mentioned so I think this is really key uh, to reach out to people, to talk to people, to to bring together people who are interested in this and keep a conversation uh, going. So that's already a, a way of knowledge transfer, I assume. But how and when it will lead to systemic change, that is still, I think, a work in progress uh, in most of the places in Europe where they started this. Mm. I was particularly interested that uh, in Canberra, uh, it was housing and child protection that drew uh, the first attention. Um, and th having a priorities which uh, w were the, the government really needed to joint work on was clearly a very important factor. Uh, I'm just wondering, Vivian, whether uh, there's any Irish perspective where uh, local authorities work together because there's a real concern for progress? Yeah, that's an interesting question too. And I, I, one of the points that struck me, um, uh, you know, when I was listening to the, the situation from Mary, Fiona and Janet in Canberra was the influence of individual problems and individual people in how new initiatives develop. And from the Irish context, uh, the, the, for me, the real growth of restorative justice initiatives started around the late 1990s. And they were in relation to uh, restorative justice in criminal justice, but also uh, through a project here in Dublin that was involved in uh, local community mediation, specifically and very frequently involving housing issues um, and the on the criminal justice side it was a number of people who went from here at the time as part of a review group into the work of the Irish probation service and some of that review group review group established by the government traveled to Australia and New Zealand uh, and and as part of that in in looking at uh, justice systems there came across restorative justice programs. Um, and as I say, at the same time here in Ireland, there, there was uh, a, a, a specific local project in Dublin um, that had been set up to uh, provide mediation services on behalf of the local authority in relation to housing disputes and housing uh, related conflicts. So, uh, you know, very much in similar to what other people have described, uh, and as you've said, John, identifiable problems on the one hand and individual people, you know, uh, that, that took an initiative in terms of responding to those identified problems. Well, thank you very much. That seems very lively. We've got two more comments, uh, which I'm going to hold on to and we'll restart uh, in about five minutes. We're going to take that break, I promised everybody, just to, to stretch. Please come back. We're, we're not stopping. We're going to come back in four or five minutes. So let's just take the break. I'll restart with the comments that we've had from our audience, for which many thanks. Please keep them coming. Uh, we'll take a, a five-minute break and then begin again with Luke Roberts. Uh, uh, and thank you for being there. So just... Relax now, everybody. We'll come back in five. You have been listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. To find out more, go to our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net or follow us on Twitter at INTCJ Network.